it's a symptom reduction model versus a healing model. It's always about, you know, make, they can handle their anxiety better, but their anxiety will always be there. But then when I added neurofeedback, it's like, no, the anxiety can actually go away completely or be significantly less rather than just learning to manage it better. So about four years ago, I added neurofeedback to my practice because I was feeling really frustrated with the ability to make progress. It was the way I was trained and the way that therapy in general works is about symptom management, not so much healing. The philosophy is really that symptoms, anxiety, depression will always be there, but you can learn coping skills and strategies to make them more manageable, to be more functional. But the idea is that those underlying problems will always be there. And I always felt like that just sold people really short, that the brain is so plastic that it must be able to achieve more. And when I found neurofeedback, I found that that was really true. And in a big way, Seaburn advocated for me to use it on myself so that I would feel how powerful of a tool this really is. And I did. And it completely reduced my anxiety. I really don't have anxiety at all. It's gone. Not a symptom reduction in the sense of I manage it better. I don't feel it. And so I've been trying to bring that to my clients, to my friends, to my family, anybody who will listen, because I think that paradigm needs to shift. So I've started using this in my practice with virtually all of my clients. And the changes compared to what was happening in just typical attachment-based, other kinds of intervention talk therapy has been quite significant. I had a client who was school refusal, years of school refusal, unable to really tell a coherent story, uh, timeline and cause and effect thinking, all sorts of deficits. We did neurofeedback for quite a while and her brain started to organize. She could tell me a story from start to finish and I could understand what she was telling me, which meant that I could understand what she felt, her experience, her world. She could finally be known and understood in a way that she never was able to before. And that's, that's just one story. I could, I could tell dozens more as Seaburn does in her book about people who suddenly felt like they could breathe again like this weight that they'd been carrying on their chest had lifted. Now, I work with developmental trauma. So these are brain-based issues that started in early childhood. A lot of this is considered intractable, that there isn't a lot of progress to be made. And this makes a lot of progress. And the more we learn and the more we do, I think we're going to make even more. So why do I think these changes are happening? I believe that neurofeedback, at least in the way that we currently practice it, is based on calming the central nervous system. It takes the very foundation of everything that our brain is built on, our limbic system, and even now with some of the work we're doing, getting into that reptilian brainstem area, we calm that area. Now the brain takes what information feedback we're giving it and makes its own choices, but the brain is always moving towards healing. It wants to be its most efficient uh, and most healthy, just in its programming. So it, if you give it the feedback, it starts moving there all on its own. So we give it a little bit of information and that system goes from here to here. And when your foundational system, you have your reptilian brain, your limbic brain, uh, then you've got your cortex and now the fourth brain, your prefrontal cortex, this is the bottom. If this is functioning on a healthy level, you can think, you can use your logic and reasoning. Uh, you can look at cause and effect, but when the very foundation is all helter-skelter, none of these higher functions have a chance to do anything. So I think it works because of the arousal model, because we are calming the very foundation of our system. So for many of the um, young people, because I work with adolescents and young adults that I work with, they've begun to, to enter into what I call survivor mode or the survivor state that is existing in all of our brains. We all have fight or flight. When you're in the jungle and the tiger comes, we've all got the same foundation to run away or to fight if you're really brave. But that system is not supposed to be engaged all the time. Um, that system is supposed to turn on when needed and turn back off. And then we have other modes, which gets technical, that our brain normally functions in. What happens for these young people is the brain is always detecting danger. 
because they're what happened when they were younger, when they were babies, primed their brain to believe there's danger everywhere because our safety is in humans. We're, we're a species that works because we band together. None of us are very safe on our own. We're safe in numbers. And when your very foundation of being with people feels unsafe, your brain essentially goes into a almost relatively permanent state of hyper arousal, or you can actually pass that as polyvagal theory will tell you, and you, you get into a state of freeze. You're actually completely shutting down because the, it, the intensity is so high. So when you're in either one of those states, you're not thinking well, you're not digesting well, um, and it leads to a whole host of a series of other problems, but it becomes a habitual state because all people are triggering because they're all seen as a danger to the system. And that goes for psychological, not just physical threats. Our systems are not set up to really know the difference that well, they'll see them both as the same thing. So they basically live their whole lives in a survivor mode and, and a fight or flight or freeze without really any ability to be in that normal state that we most of us live in. Most of my clients exist in this state almost entirely. I've actually shown them the polyvagal chart and said, where do you think you are? Look, read through it. And they'll tell me they're either in the freeze state or the fight or flight state. And they'll admit they almost are never in the, the kind of bottom green state, which is where most of us exist. And so with neurofeedback, my goal is to help their body start to release that pattern. So by giving their brain feedback, which I also believe that meditation and other forms can get people there, but when they're here and meditation is here, it takes a lot, a lot of practice to go from one to the other. And most modern teenagers have, <laughs> with social media, uh, that, that's a lot more time than they really have the ability to commit right now. So neurofeedback, you start here. And, and in three minutes, you go from here to here. And then in the next three minutes, here to here. And maybe next week, we get to here. And in a couple of months, and in some of these cases, a couple of years, suddenly we're down here. And so my goal is to help them teach their own brain what it's like to be in a calmer state until we can actually get to a state of real calm. So we watch for the body to relax, the jaw. Suddenly, they'll tell me their jaw feels different. Um, and I can see jaw tension and neck tension on, on my screen. So I can see when that relaxes. And jaw tension and neck tension are major sources of headaches. So that helps too. Um, so you see the whole body starts to get out of this tensed up fight or flight state and into a, a relaxed state because the neurofeedback gives their, their brain and their mind the feedback that that's the right thing to do and it feels good so that so their brain will keep allowing it to happen.